Though the rank and file battle droids of the CIS droid army weren't terribly formidable opponents, the Confederacy's elite units tended to be much more threatening. The infamous droidikas could change the course of entire battles, while General Grievous's Magna Guards could even kill Jedi. The elite droids we'll be discussing today were a bit less fearsome, but they were considerably more versatile. We're talking about the BX series droid commando, a much more advanced edition of the standard B1 battle droid, and in this video, we'll be looking at what made them so effective. The BX series droid commando was a product of Bactoid Combat Automata, the same Genosian firm that produced the older B1 and B2 battle droids. Though the previous models in the B series were designed to be mass produced for combat, after the start of the Clone Wars, Bactoid started to shift toward designing elite units, determining that B1 and B2 were enough to fill out the ranks of the droid army. The B3 Ultra Battle Droid, a design based on the B2 Super Battle Droid, was an early foray into the production of an elite B series droid. The BX Commando was another such attempt. The BX bore many resemblances to the older B1 battle droids, but these commando droids were completely new designs with much more effort put into the development of their hardware and software alike. While the joints of the B1's limbs provided limited mobility and were only held together magnetically, which made them a notorious weak spot, the BX featured tougher joints that not only provided greater ranges of motion, but also allowed commando droids to move much faster than their rank and file counterparts. In general, commando droids were more flexible and more agile, and they seemed to have been stronger as well. Commando droids also had much heavier armor than the B1s, and their plating seems to have been on par with that of the B2. A BX could shrug off multiple blaster shots to the chest, and the droid's only apparent weak spot seems to have been the head. Commando droids were also shown to have been able to remain functioning despite extreme damage, such as being sliced in half at the waist. The commando droid's frame was much sleeker than the B1, and this wasn't just for appearance's sake. The BX was specifically designed to more closely mimic the rough shape of a human body, allowing them to wear clone trooper armor for infiltration missions. To enhance the disguise, commando droids had the ability to perfectly mimic voices, though their limited vocabulary and inability to mimic the quirks and mannerisms of organic beings meant that this was only effective to a point. It's also worth asking how the hell they managed to convincingly imitate beings with five fingers when they only had three which were much thicker than human fingers. But there's no convincing answer to that question as far as we can find, so we'll leave the matter alone. As commandos, BXs were programmed for a wide variety of roles. Primarily, they were used as commandos or as elite soldiers, but they were also deployed as prison guards, snipers, interrogators, and gunners. Naturally, the equipment they were issued varied accordingly. Almost all BXs carried E5 blaster rifles standard issue weapon for the CIS droid army, though they could use them much better than B1s could, as they had better accuracy and a better sense of cover. Commando droids stationed to defend key positions, such as the Citadel on Lola Seyu, paired these blaster rifles with handheld energy shields. Many commando droids were shown to carry vibro swords. Typically, only the captain of a commando droid squad would carry a sword, but standard BXs have been shown making use of them as well. Commando droids could use these swords to deadly effect, as they seem to have been extremely skilled in close quarters combat. Commando droids have even been shown fighting in unarmed combat and performing quite well at it too. BXs were sometimes also equipped with stun batons, while those assigned to act as snipers made use of sniper rifles, as you might expect. Most, or all BXs, also seem to have been equipped with fusion cutters built into their forearms which allow them to slice through sealed doors. Other equipment employed by commando droids includes thermal detonators and macro binoculars. The commando droid was developed a few months into the Clone Wars and its first deployments were in late 22 BBY. Their first known appearance was in an attack on the Republic outpost on the Rishi moon, but this probably wasn't their first outing, as at that time, Captain Rex was already aware of their existence and the Kaminoans had developed lookalikes to serve as training droids into Poker City. Nonetheless, the Rishi Moon battle was an excellent demonstration of the BX's capabilities. A single squad of the droids successfully infiltrated and captured a Republic base, killing or chasing off its defenders, 
and they would have gotten away with it if the base hadn't happened to be due for an inspection the day of the attack. Even then, the commando droids proved tough and dangerous in their skirmishes against Captain Rex, Commander Cody, and the remainder of Domino's squad, and their hot wiring of the base's communication systems was so thorough that the clones had to blow up the whole building just to let the Republic know that something was up. After Rishi, commando droids made sporadic appearances in engagements all over the galaxy, often posing a serious threat to Republic forces. On Seleucami, a BX sniper came extraordinarily close to killing Captain Rex, missing a fatal shot by less than an inch. During the Battle of Lola Seyu, the unit of commando droids assigned to guard the Citadel proved nigh unstoppable when backed with the Citadel's defense systems, and not even the presence of several Jedi allowed the Republic infiltration team to hold them off for more than a few minutes at a time. In the later half of the war, their appearances became steadily more common, with small groups of commando droids showing up on Felucia, Kiros, Dathomir, Onderon, and Ringo Vinda. Commando droids weren't just perfect. Jedi and clones were capable of destroying them without too much hassle in an even fight. But these droids were skilled at stacking the odds in their favor, and they had a tendency to complicate missions when Republic forces least expected it, allowing them to do serious damage. They weren't super soldiers, but they were pretty close for battle droids. They were intelligent, agile, tough, and versatile. They may have looked a lot like the standard B1s, but individually, they were better in every conceivable way. With all this in mind, it's worth asking why the Confederacy bothered using standard battle droids at all when the BX was so much better. There's two answers to that question. First, it would have been prohibitively expensive. Commando droids didn't come cheap, and the Confederacy couldn't manufacture enough to serve as a full army. It could deploy them in considerable numbers here and there, but by necessity, most of the time the droid army could only spare a small squad or two of BXs. The second answer is a bit more interesting. As Dave Filoni pointed out in the commentary featurette for the episode in which the droids first appeared, despite their obviously superior design, the commando droids failed to hold the Rishi Moon outpost when the clones counterattacked, while an army of B1s was able to recapture it with relative ease. This, Filoni stated, was something that the writing team had done on purpose to establish that the original battle droids were still a threat, even if they were less advanced, due to their advantage in numbers. This harkens back to something we discussed in our videos about the B1. Assessing the standard battle droids and comparing them to other soldiers or droid models on an individual level misses the point of their design. B1s weren't meant to operate as individuals, they were meant to fight in force, with the advantage of numbers on their side. Though they were superior to the B1 on an individual level, the BX's complex design left them unable to exploit the most important battlefield advantage battle droids had, their mass producibility. The commando droid then is best understood not as an improved version of the B1, but as a variant meant for a different mission profile. The B-1 was designed to hold battlefields, to be deployed in vast numbers to overwhelm and crush the enemy, but in small groups with more complex objectives, they performed extremely poorly. The BX took over that niche, which it was much better suited for, but if the Confederacy had tried to use them to take over the B-1's niche as well, they would have bankrupted themselves. The commando droid was just one part of a much larger droid army. Star Wars has a wide variety of unusual droids, and most of them are endearing in their own way. But the Buzz Droid, while certainly an interesting and unique concept, was much more of a nuisance. These vicious little gremlins were well known for their programmed habit of ripping starfighters to shreds. And though they haven't appeared all that much in Star Wars media, they're nonetheless memorable for their 5 minutes of fame in Revenge of the Sith. In this video, We'll be taking an in-depth look at these little buggers, examining what made them so dangerous for their size. Before we begin, take a few seconds to guess who made these crafty little droids. They've got a unique, distinctly non-human design that can become little balls for transport, and they're distinctly vicious in unusual ways. In other words, they're right on brand for the Colocoid Creation Nest, and if you guess that the Buzz Droid came from the same group that manufactured the Deadly Droidica, you'd be correct. The Colocoids, for those of you who are unfamiliar with them, were an insectoid species from the planet Collar 4. 
They somewhat resemble their signature droidicas, shared their iconic ability to curl up into balls for faster transport, and were typically similarly vicious. The average colicoid was quite violent, in large part because they were ever ravenous carnivores that weren't picky about what they ate. They were even known to eat each other in times of stress. Such was their hunger that the Trade Federation actually paid for its original shipments of droidicas with freighters full of exotic meats for the colicoids to enjoy, which the insectoids readily accepted. The colicoids weren't just vicious, however, they were also extraordinarily inventive. The colicoid creation nest produced some of the most feared war machines the galaxy had ever seen, after all, and they were great at making servant droids and the like as well. Their inspiration for their droids often came from Colour 4's environment, which was full of unique and dangerous creatures that the Colicoids took inspiration from. The Droidica was based on the Colicoids themselves, the Tri-Fighter was modelled on the skull shape of one of Colour 4's most vicious predators, and the Buzz Droid was based on the Pisto, a pest from the planet's tropical region. In fact, Buzz Droid is just a nickname, much like Destroyer Droid for the Droidica. Their real name was the Pistoica Sabotage Droid, with Pisto referring to the pest, and Ica being the colloquial word for drone or servant. Buzz Droid is easier to say though, so we're going to stick with that name going forward. Anyway, the Buzz Droid was actually a refit of an older colloquial model. When pressed for new droid models midway through the war by the Separatist leadership, the colloquial creation nest just took their existing repair droids, gave them some new toys, and reprogrammed them to dismantle ships instead of putting them back together. The result was one of the most feared droid models ever deployed in naval warfare. Each buzz droid was powered by a small internal reactor located in the main body of the droid, which, naturally, could be primed to self-destruct to inflict even more damage on an enemy craft. Their faces featured three photoreceptor eyes, one main eye and two secondary ones, which provided additional spatial awareness and could double as X-ray sensors. A small antenna mounted on top of their heads provided them with a direct link of nearby central control computers, though they were capable of independent thought and operation. Their main bodies also featured a set of small maneuvering thrusters on their backs, which allowed them to move while still in ball mode. When deployed, a buzz droid's most noticeable feature was a pair of wing-like armored shells suspended above their heads, which mimicked the wings of the pisto. These were thin but remarkably durable, made from shock-absorbing materials and coated with a heat-dissipating alloy that allowed the droid to penetrate even the toughest energy shields. The entire droid could curl up into these shells for transport, with only their maneuvering thrusters and eyes poking out through gaps in the armor. Typically, they were deployed in this configuration and remained in it until they had pierced a target craft's shields. When deployed, buzz droids made use of a single magnetic foot, which allowed the droids to latch onto starship hulls. Typically, they would use their other arms to scuttle around a craft looking for a point to start drilling, and when they found a target site, they would magnetize to the spot, making them near impossible to shake off or detach without extreme measures. Apart from their single legs, buzz droids had other arms, each of which was tipped with a type of sabotage tool. These could include circular saws, prying hooks, picket and pincer arms, drill heads and plasma torches. Buzz droids also featured an extendable probe that could interface with a ship's computer. Since the droids were programmed with the stolen schematics of most Republic craft, they usually had an easy time finding vulnerable computer ports. The main tool of the buzz droid, however, was a large cutting drill mounted just below the eyes. This drill could cut through bomber-grade starfighter armor without much trouble, allowing the buzz droid access to a craft's more vulnerable parts. Buzz droids were also equipped with a small pair of blasters, one on either side of the central eye. They can be difficult to spot, but they are there, and buzz droids could use them for self-defense. They didn't seem to use their guns all that much, however, preferring to use their sabotage tools when they needed to fight. Buzz droids were deployed by Discord missiles, large tracking missiles that could be carried aboard most separatist fighter craft. Capable of accelerating at up to 10,000 Gs and carrying seven buzz droids each, Discord missiles were notoriously tricky for Republic pilots to avoid, and they could turn any dogfight into pure chaos. 
Discord missiles were typically carried aboard Tri-Fighters, which could carry six of them for a total of 42 buzz droids. But they were sometimes also deployed by Vulture droids, which could carry four for a total of 28 buzz droids. Once launched, Discord missiles would pick a target, overshoot them a little, and then explode, raining buzz droids down on their unlucky victims. All told, the buzz droid was a compact but extraordinarily dangerous little droid, built and programmed for absolute mayhem. They seemed to have a love for chaos and a penchant for violence, often going out of their way to break things that they really didn't need to target, as exemplified by buzz droids killing R4P17 during the Battle of Coruscant. Though they were designed to be deployed against starships, buzz droids were also able to pick a fight with infantry, using their tools to dismantle enemy clone troopers, typically with gruesome results. Usually, buzz droids disabled enemy craft instead of destroying them outright, both to allow the confederacy to capture the ship and to distract their victims' comrades, who could become preoccupied with rescuing them and thus fall victim to tri-fighters or other separatist craft. The buzz droid's usual strategy was to crawl over a ship and attack targets of opportunity, crippling systems in no particular order, often with chaotic results. In every case, however, they would start by taking control of the ship away from the pilot, leaving them unable to do anything about the mechanical gremlins, leaving them unable to do anything about the mechanical gremlins having a field day with their fighter. Buzz droids were introduced around the same time as the Tri Fighter in 21 BBY, and they made an immediate impact on naval warfare. While the individual activities of the droids didn't make much of a difference, the sheer chaos of buzz droid attacks left Republic squadrons reeling, allowing other Separatist craft to swoop in and wipe them out. Buzz droids became even more of a nuisance after Darth Sidious supplied the Colocoids with a complete set of Republic Starfighter schematics, which they then programmed into their droids. The first known appearance of the buzz droid was shortly before the Karita incident in 20 BBY, when a swarm of them attacked D Squad aboard the captured Star Destroyer Renown. They went on to appear in a number of major battles, most notably the defense of Cadonomordia and the Battle of Coruscant. At Cadonomordia, a swarm of buzz droids nearly killed Anakin Skywalker himself by disabling his fighter, while at Coruscant, another swarm did the same to Obi-Wan Kenobi. After the end of the Clone Wars, all buzz droids were reactivated, but billions of them were left behind in Separatist warehouses, many of which were raided by underworld factions. During the Age of the Empire, Buzz droids became a common sight in junkyards, not as scrap, but as scrappers, a job to which they were well suited. They were also commonly used in droid gladiator rings, where they often quite literally ripped their opponents to shreds. Some crime lords were also known for using buzz droids to dismantle the bodies of their enemies for disposal, sometimes while the victims were still alive. During the Clone Wars, the Confederacy of Independent Systems deployed a massive droid army against the Republic. Often, army detachments were commanded by organic officers, but due to the scale of the war, these weren't always available, and in those cases, command fell to droid officers. But battle droid commanders weren't terribly intelligent, leading to the introduction of tactical droids, which were much more competent and effective. But tactical droids also had weaknesses, most notably their incredible arrogance, leading to the introduction of new models later in the war, super tactical droids. These hulking droid commanders were not only extremely intelligent, but they were more effective than many organic commanders, and they were often given high ranks in the CIS military. In this video, we'll be taking a look at this underrated and undeniably cool droid model. The original tactical droids, to their credit, were quite intelligent. They were good at strategy and probability, and they lacked the shortcomings of the standard OOM series battle droid commanders. They're about as competent as your average commissioned officer, and they could support organic officers as well, acting as aides and strategic assistants for the likes of Watt Tambor, Admiral Trench, and General Grievous. They were constantly running calculations and simulations with their highly advanced data processing models, adjusting their plans on the fly as they believed the odds dictated. But they were far from perfect. Tactical droids' tactics weren't foolproof. They had difficulty accounting for Jedi or irrational action on the part of their enemies. Unorthodox tactics, 
especially ones that involved tactical sacrifices or Jedi involvement, could flummox them fairly easily. But the tactical droids also had a flaw in their personalities. They were insufferably arrogant. Believing themselves to be superior to their droid nature, some had a near total inability to recognize flaws in their tactics. They also had a dislike for taking orders from meat bags, especially when those meat bags made command decisions that conflicted with what they calculated was the best course of action. On several occasions, tactical droids betrayed or even assassinated their organic commanders out of frustration over their seemingly irrational command decisions. Sometimes, this was beneficial to the Confederacy. In the first Battle of Plagen, a tactical droid that shot his commander and threw out his battle plan led Separatist forces to victory against the odds. Most of the time, however, these betrayals cost the Confederacy dearly. Wat Tambor, a leading member of the Separatist Council, was captured by the Republic after his tactical droid left him for dead on Ryloth, and the Republic won the Third Battle of Aifao because a tactical droid's assassination of his commander started a firefight in the Separatist Command Bunker. Tactical droids were nonetheless effective and they saw use until the end of the Clone Wars, but their manufacturer, Bactoid Combat Automata, believed that improvements could be made. Thus, halfway through the war, they came out with a new model. The Super Tactical Droid, officially known as the ST Series Military Strategic Analysis and Tactics Droid in canon. The chassis of the Super Tactical Droid was an improvement over that of its predecessor, boasting heavier armor and greater physical strength and agility. It resembled the chassis of the standard tactical droid with a box-like abdominal section and bulbous limbs, but it had a sleeker design, which was presumably more efficient. The droid's head took a different shape, retaining only a hint of its predecessor's distinctive visor, and for reasons unknown, the super tactical droid had three eyes instead of two. Super tactical droids weren't intended to serve in combat, however, as many tactical droids had invariably found themselves in direct danger, their successes were designed to be able to hold their own should the need arise. On top of their improved durability, strength, and especially agility, the super tactical droid could fight both at range and in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Like most separatist droids, they favored E5 blaster rifles, but some super tactical droids were shown to be pretty good with their fists too. The one known as Kraken once picked a fight with Anakin Skywalker and even landed a few good hits before he lost his hands to Skywalker's lightsaber. The more important improvements to the tactical droid were in how they were programmed, however. Super tactical droids were several orders of magnitude more intelligent than standard tactical droids and they were much more adaptable. Like their predecessors, they were constantly running calculations and simulations but they didn't base their decisions solely on mathematics. They took intuitive leaps and accounted for irrationalities and Jedi nonsense better than their predecessors, allowing them to anticipate and counter even the most unorthodox of strategies. They were more intelligent and more competent than most organic commanders, and even the Jedi saw these droids as a genuine threat. Super tactical droids were cunning commanders in virtually any field able to lead Separatist forces to victory in virtually any theater. They were better at picking up on and countering the kinds of stunts that the Jedi often tried to pull, and they were trusted enough by Separatist leadership that some were assigned overall command of major battles. Perhaps their most valuable asset, though, is that they could think like organics. They weren't only capable of predicting the decisions of organic commanders, but they could understand the thought processes behind those decisions which is what made them such cunning opponents. In some cases, super tactical droids served as aides and strategic advisors for the Confederacy's very highest ranking officers, such as Admiral Trench, General Grievous, or Count Dooku. Most of the time, however, they worked alone, reporting only to Dooku and Grievous themselves. Super tactical droids were afforded high ranks, with General being a common one, meaning that they outranked the majority of the Confederacy's organic officers. Some commanded huge droid armies, while others were given control of parts of the Confederate Navy. Some, such as General Kalani, had authority over both. Super tactical droids were highly individualized. Like their predecessors, each unit differed in terms of voice, program gender, and paint scheme, 
but many super tactical droids went a step further, going by names instead of identifying numbers. They developed unique personalities and command styles, and overall, they were the most organic-like droids in the droid army, on top of being the highest ranking. Legends gives us five super tactical droid characters, most of them from Star Wars The Clone Wars. Two which shared the same paint job, Alt-O and another that went unnamed, were naval commanders and major players in the Confederacy's planned attack on Republic Strategic Conference above Corita. Both of these super tactical droids were destroyed during this operation. Alt-O was killed by D-Squad aboard his flagship, while the other was blown up above Corita. Two others acted as strategic aides for the Confederacy's top military leaders. One, named Kraken, served Admiral Trench and later Count Dooku, while the other, Teizuka, acted as a lieutenant for General Grievous. Teizuka was destroyed by Darth Maul above Ord Mantell, while Kraken was destroyed by Anakin Skywalker during the Battle of Ringo Vinda, though he was rebuilt in time for the Battle of Scipio. The final super tactical droid in Legends is undoubtedly the coolest of them all. General Kalani, a formidable officer in his own right, who commanded a droid army to support King Rash on Onderon and had the coolest voice of any Star Wars character bar none. Do not underestimate our means. If the rebel army falls, the citizens will lose their courage and order will be restored. Canon stories provide us with additional examples of noteworthy super tactical droids. Many of these go unnamed, such as a General Kalani lookalike who serves as an A to General Grievous before being destroyed above Utapau, or a super tactical droid that commands Separatist forces on Melagoni. Despite the rebuilding of Kraken, by the time of the Battle of Anaxes, Trench has a different super tactical droid acting as his aid, and this droid is also killed by Anakin Skywalker shortly before Trench's own death. Other super tactical droids, like General Kalani, act as commanders in their own right. There's one on Yerbana that's destroyed by Anakin Skywalker in a flagrant violation of the Yavin Code, and in canon, Separatist forces fighting in the Battle of Kashyyyk were commanded by super tactical droid General Lin Wodo, a super tactical droid acting on orders from General Grievous. General Lin Wodo also participated in major battles on Metalorn and Boz Pity, defending those key Separatist strongholds during the Outer Rim sieges. Despite their questionable quality, the battle droids of the CIS droid army were pretty versatile, able to handle just about every environment. They could operate in environments ranging from deserts to jungles, from rolling plains to stagnant swamps. They were even able to operate in the vacuum of space. But there was one place that the Confederacy's standard battle droids couldn't fight in, the deep ocean. To accommodate for this, the Separatists produced another droid model designed specifically to handle these conditions, the AQ series battle droid, better known as the Aquadroid. In this video, we'll be taking a closer look at these little seen combat droids. For the most part, the surface armies of the CIS and Republic alike were designed to fight on solid ground. On most planets, the depths of the oceans were not only difficult to reach, but usually not worth reaching. But there were exceptions to this rule. The galaxy had many aquatic species, many of whom lived on water worlds. In the Star Wars galaxy, aquatic species tended to be somewhat isolated from galactic civilization due to environmental incompatibility, especially for species that exclusively lived underwater. But there were exceptions with the Mon Calamari and Quarren of Dak being the most noteworthy. As most of you probably know, the two sentient species of Dak, also known as Mon Cala, played major roles in the Clone Wars. The Mon Calamari, who lived in the shallower parts of the ocean and were the wealthier and more privileged of the two peoples, were generally strong supporters of the Galactic Republic. The depth-dwelling, oft-marginalized Quarren, on the other hand, largely supported the confederacy of independent systems. This wasn't a hard and fast rule, of course. Quarren Senator Tundra Daumeo was a loyalist, while Mon Calamari war hero Commander Mirai was a separatist. But thanks to the efforts of the Quarren Isolation League, a separatist faction led by Senator Tikes, many of the Quarren were radicalized to the separatist cause, 
while many Mon Calamari were radicalized to the Loyalist one, making conflict on Dak inevitable. The first such battle happened just a few months into the war, when the Quarren Isolation League tried to seize control of the planet. They received reinforcements from the CIS droid army for this purpose, consisting primarily of ordinary Geonosian made B-1 battle droids supported by underwater vehicles. These B-1s could operate underwater. While water and electronics generally don't mix, B-1s, like most droids, had insulated circuits that allowed them to operate underwater and even at considerable pressure. But they weren't very good at it. The B-1s deployed by the Quarren Isolation League relied on mini-subs that they rode into battle like speeder bikes, essentially acting as light cavalry. But these mini-subs were only armed with a single fixed laser cannon and they weren't all that maneuverable. The Mon Calamari and Grand Army of the Republic made short work of them, and in the end, they won the Battle of Mon Calamari fairly decisively. Clearly, just deploying B-1s on mini-subs was not a good underwater strategy for the CIS. They needed dedicated aqua droids. Apparently, they didn't trust Bactoid Combat Automata to make the aqua droids, as they turned to Hao Chal Engineering, the producers of the Vulture droid, instead. We suppose this makes sense, since Bactoid was run by Genotians, who lived on desert planets and were generally unused to oceans. Furthermore, Hao Chal was the company responsible for the Confederacy's most useful asset in the Battle of Mon Calamari, the Manta Droid Subfighter, an underwater version of the Vulture Droid that gave the Republic and Mon Calamari a run for their money. With this in mind, we can see why they were chosen to design the Aquadroid. Hao Chal, in collaboration with the Techno Union, loosely based their Aquadroids on the B2 Super Battle Droid. They bore little resemblance, however. Their physique was almost uncannily slim, especially around their hips and elbows, though the droids were apparently deceptively durable. They seemed to have extensive flexibility in their abdomens, in contrast to ordinary battle droids, which was likely for increased underwater mobility. Their legs were spindly down to their knees, past which they became flattened and blade-like. The feet of the aquadroid could be converted to double as propellers, which, combined with their blade-like lower legs, gave them considerable underwater maneuverability. In contrast to their extremely thin abdomens, the aquadroid had a very broad chest, which made them appear rather top-heavy. The droid's arms were rounded and thin, with armored plates extending well above their shoulders. The droids had three-fingered hands that were likely compatible with most standard-issue blasters, but they mostly relied on retractable forearm-mounted laser cannons. Much like super battle droids, some aqua droids swapped out their left arms for rocket launchers, dramatically increasing their firepower. The aqua droid's head was flat and only had one photoreceptor eye. This head could partially retract into the droid's body to improve its aerodynamics. Aquadroids had roughly the same degree of intelligence and capability as the B-2 Super Battle Droid, and despite their frail appearance, their armor was about as tough as that of the B-2 as well. The Aquadroid was painted in reflexive chrome, which, if you ask us, only further strengthens their resemblance to the modern Cylon Centurion. Obviously, they were strongly insulated against water damage, and they presumably were designed to handle enormous amounts of pressure, allowing them to operate deep below the surface of an ocean. After all, as we're sure most of you are now keenly aware, pressure is the biggest killer in the deep sea, and since the separatist Quarren allies lived on the sea floor, aquadroids would have needed to be quite durable. Underwater aquadroids were a menace to loyalist forces. They were extremely good swimmers and highly maneuverable, making them hard to hit, never mind destroy. Whereas their B2 cousins were heavily armored but slow and lumbering, the aquadroid was both heavily armored and very fast, making them much tougher to fight than your average battle droid. They had more powerful weaponry too. The arm-mounted laser cannon of the aquadroid was more powerful than any blaster, able to shoot down light vehicles with ease. The Aquadroid's only shortcoming was that it sucked at fighting on land. Above the ocean's surface, they were just as sluggish and ungainly as the B2 Super Battle Droids they were based on, 
making them much easier for loyalist troops to destroy. With that said, these were aquadroids designed for fighting underwater, so this isn't exactly a criminal oversight in our book. Despite their effectiveness, aquadroids didn't see too much action in the Clone Wars, mostly because underwater battles weren't terribly common. Their first known appearance was during the Battle of Kamino, when they were deployed from orbit aboard insertion pods hidden in the wreckage of Separatist warships. When this wreckage crashed into Kamino's oceans, the aquadroids emerged and began assembling trident assault craft, which leapt out of the water to attack Topoka City. The tridents deployed armies of aquadroids and standard B1s into the city, nearly costing the Republic its primary cloning facility. However, the Republic won the battle in large part thanks to the shortcoming we mentioned earlier. The aquadroids were sluggish when fighting into Poker City, allowing Republic forces to drive them off and save the city. The only other known appearance of the aquadroid came on the planet we mentioned earlier, Dak, which in late 21 BBY became a battlefield yet again. After the first battle, the Quarren Isolation League was driven off-world, but many of Mon Calamari's remaining Quarren remained loyal to the Confederacy, and thanks to the political engineering of Separatist officer Riff Tamsin, they went to war against their surface-dwelling neighbors once again. This time, they had the support of Aquadroids and other new Separatist weapons, and it made a noticeable difference. In the Battle of Mon Cala, the Quarren and their Separatist allies nearly crushed the Mon Calamarian clone forces, even despite the arrival of Gungan reinforcements for the Loyalists. The Republic only emerged victorious after the Quarren turned on the Separatists. With the peoples of Dak united against them, not even the Confederacy's versatile Aquadroids could stop them from taking back their planet. For those of you who didn't know, crabs are superior beings. In the real world, crabs have independently evolved about a dozen different times, an evolutionary process called carcinization. Evolution, apparently, is weighted in favor of crabs, and not even the war droids of the Star Wars universe were immune to this evolutionary pull. The LM-432 crab droid is proof that the obvious superiority of crab-like forms is evident even across universes, not least because the crab droid itself was a highly effective war machine. In this video, we'll be analyzing the crab droid in detail. At the start of the Clone Wars, Wat Tambor pledged the Techno Union droid army to the service of Count Dooku, pooling it with the private militaries of the other Separatist Council factions to form the CIS droid army. The bulk of the Techno Union's contributions came in the form of droid infantry. After all, Bactoid Combat Automata, the designers and producers of the B1 and B2 battle droids, was a Techno Union member. But the Techno Union contributed larger tank droids as well, most notably the Octoptara Combat Tridroid and the Octoptara Magna Tridroid, which we've made a video about recently. But as the Clone Wars went on, the Techno Union began producing new war machines for the Separatist cause as well. The LM-432 Crab Droid was one of these. Originally, they were designed for use on marshy worlds where many of the Confederacy's other armored vehicles had trouble operating, but the Crab Droid model ended up being the basis for a plethora of variants, which were meant to fill various gaps in the Confederacy's vehicle arsenal. Much like crabs in the real world, Crab Droids expanded to fill a variety of niches, proving themselves the superior droid design as well as the superior evolutionary template. In all seriousness, the Techno Union had a very simple reason for just reusing the Crab Droid model like this. They usually performed alright on the battlefield, but more importantly, they were a very cost-effective design. To quote a Techno Union risk assessment report, Crab Droids have a subpar targeting percentage, but deliver a profit of 48,000 credits per unit. They might not win the war, but they could save the Techno Union's fiscal quarter. This sort of approach to military structure, for the record, is at least part of why the Confederacy lost the Clone Wars. The LM-432 Crab Droid's basic design was simple. The droid consisted of a main body with six heavily armored legs. Their size was variable based on the specific model of the droid. Some Crab Droids were just a meter tall, while others were nearly seven meters tall. The Crab Droid's main body was small and compact, though the degree of this again varied based on model. This main body always contained the droid's onboard power plant and droid brain, however, as well as a bunch of sensors mounted on the droid's face. 
These included three photoreceptor eyes and a set of antennae, which added to the droid's crab-like appearance. Most of the crab droid's bulk, no matter the variant, was taken up by its legs. Some crab droids had six legs, while others only had four. Either way, a crab droid's legs consisted of three segments. One that usually extended straight down under the droid, one of varying length that extended outwards, and a large heavily armored lower leg. The crab droid's four legs featured its heaviest armor plating, and crab droids could use them as shields to protect their eyes or other weak points from incoming fire. These armor-plus shells were extremely durable, and thinner armor-plus plating was located on the main body of the droid. Its body armor was less comprehensive, however, and while its face was well protected, its back was not. Over the course of the Clone Wars, clone troopers quickly learned that they could easily take out a crab droid by sneaking up behind it, climbing onto its back, and emptying a clip into the weak points in its armor. The four legs of the crab droid also boasted two other key features. They were twipped with claw-like duranium stabilizers, which could burrow into the ground to stabilize the droid by locking in place. These stabilizers could pierce bedrock and allow the crab droid to climb up near vertical cliffs with ease. The forelegs also contained powerful vacuum pumps, which were meant to act as, for lack of a better term, weapons. These were meant for use in the swamp environments the crab droid was originally designed for. They could be used to suck up mud and swamp water and then unceremoniously spray them at the enemy, covering their visors or sensors in gunk and, more often than not, inciting frustration and confusion. We don't know what intern at the Techno Union came up with that, but we hope they got a medal for it. Because of these mud spewers, clone troopers nicknamed the crab droid the muckraker, and we're sure these droids lived rent-free in their heads for getting swamp gunk all over their nice white armor. But the crab droid didn't just have prank weapons, it was also equipped with a pair of chin-mounted blaster cannons. These were roughly as powerful as a droidica's blaster cannons, and they had several firing models, including linked fire, which was particularly devastating, and rapid fire. These laser cannons made the crab droid extremely effective against infantry or light vehicles, and in the right circumstances, its mud cannons could probably blind an ATTE2, which is a rather funny thing to picture. Of course, the crab droid's legs themselves were also weapons of a sort. They were so well armored that they could essentially be used as clubs, whacking clones and loyalist soldiers out of the way. All told, the crab droid was a pretty versatile war machine, though it certainly wasn't perfect. It had weak points, as we mentioned earlier, and it also wasn't terribly accurate with its guns, as we also mentioned earlier. Everything we've discussed so far applies primarily to the two most common crab droid variants. The six-legged anti-infantry model that appeared in Revenge of the Sith, and the slightly larger four-legged anti-infantry model that appeared in the Clone Wars. But there were a few other notable variants. One of these was a mini crab droid that was designed for espionage instead of combat, and while this droid was only briefly mentioned in a source book, we already want to keep one as a pet. The other variant you might remember from the original Clone Wars micro series, a 7 meter tall tank droid variant. The tank droid variant of the Crab Droid was mostly just an upsized and more heavily armored version of the LM-432, but it also came with an unusual secondary weapon, a bubble wart projector. These were obscure Gungan weapons that projected energy shield bubbles around their targets, trapping them in a bubble of plasma that was impossible to escape from the inside. These were meant to capture Jedi, immobilizing them and essentially taking them out of the battle unless they had an ally around to pop their bubbles. The earliest known deployment of the crab droid was on Rhodia near the start of the war, but after their introduction, these droids quickly became a staple of the CIS droid army. Often serving alongside a similar kind of droid walker, the DSD-1 dwarf spider droid, the crab droid was most commonly deployed on worlds with rough or uneven terrain. These included swamp planets, which they were designed for, but it also included mountainous worlds like Lola Seyu, where their stabilizers came in handy. On Lola Seyu, a small army of crab droids was assigned to defend the citadel. The first notable battle to involve crab droids was the Battle of Malastair, in which many were destroyed by the Republic's electro-proton bomb. They were especially common during the Outer Rim sieges, where Republic forces faced them en masse in the Battle of Tar Morden, Coruscant, and Utapal. After the end of the Clone Wars, all surviving crab droids were shut down, but this wasn't the end of their service history. 
The Techno Union had produced so many of them that there were tens of thousands just sitting around in warehouses across the Outer Rim, and criminal groups or bounty hunters had an easy time stealing and reactivating them for personal use. The Galactic Empire also seized tens of thousands of crab droids, and during the Imperial Era, it actually made use of them now and again, deploying the old Separatist units as part of the Imperial Army. Cloaking devices are a recurrent trope in sci-fi, and while they might not appear in Star Wars as much as, for example, Star Trek, they make an appearance every now and then. From Darth Maul's Sith infiltrator Scimitar to the Republic's prototype stealth ship seen in the Battle of Christosis, we've seen a number of prominent cloak ships over the years. But smaller scale cloaking technology is a lot more rare. After all, in the Star Wars universe, True cloaking devices required rare and expensive Stygium crystal arrays to function, which were notoriously hard to miniaturize. And yet, the CIS had chameleon droids, which, for all intents and purposes, were capable of fully cloaking themselves despite only being about the size of your average sentient being. So what gives? In this video, we'll be taking a closer look at these sneaky separatist droids and determining how they really work. The Chameleon Droid, which you might remember from the 2003 Star Wars The Clone Wars Micro Series, was based on the Spelunka Probe Droid, a product of Arakid Industries. Arakid was a ruthless droid maker based on Volpta and a member of the Techno Union, though during the Clone Wars it played both sides of the war and later became a major supporter of the Empire. But it built the Spelunka for the Commerce Guild, which intended to use the droids for its mining operations. The Spelunka was designed to be deployed on a wide variety of planets, able to operate anywhere so long as there was solid ground to stand on. When the time came for the droids to be deployed, they would be sent planetside via hyperspace pods. The idea was that the Commerce Guild would unleash them on unexplored worlds where they would survey potential mining sites and deploy charges for preliminary blasting if they stumbled onto anything good. These droids became a core part of the Commerce Guild's mining operations which were one of the most profitable industries it was involved in, many of which were military in design and intended to murder striking miners, the Spelunka was mostly harmless. It carried a bunch of high-powered mining charges, sure, but these weren't used to kill or maim anyone, at least not on purpose. This was how Arakid intended for the droids to be used too. Though they themselves were ruthless in their own right, Arakid knew what the Commerce Guild liked to do with their droids and they had the guild sign a contract promising the Spelunka wouldn't be used for military purposes. Then the Clone Wars began. Arakid, as we mentioned earlier, was a Techno Union member and remained so during the war, producing war material for the Confederacy, especially spy droids and probes. However, Arakid also spied on the Confederacy for the Republic. As a Techno Union member, it was now a junior partner in the Separatist War effort so Commerce Guild Presidente Shu Mei had no qualms about breaking her contract with Arakid and using the Spelunka droids for military purposes. The Guild and another department of the Techno Union collaborated to alter the design of the Spelunka for this purpose. Shu Mei originally wanted to use the redesigned droids as mine layers, but the engineers at the Techno Union had a better idea. They equipped it with a camouflage matrix that all but rendered the droid invisible creating the Chameleon Droid. The original design of the Spelunka was pretty hardy and required little adjustment for military service. The droid was 2 meters tall and quite well armored, as it was designed to be able to operate on planets with less than ideal conditions. Its main body consisted of two cylindrical sections in a cross formation, with the droid's power cells, its droid brain and its sensors all located above the center of the cross. The droid's head featured three blue visual sensors, and on the original Spelunka probe droid, its chest featured an additional, more comprehensive sensor package. Its droid brain was also redesigned to be able to hold schematics for target structures. Much like the original Spelunka, the chameleon droid scuttled about on four spidery legs. These could carry the droid at high speeds across all manner of terrain, but they did so with invisible assistance. The main body of the droid featured repulsor lifts to help keep it stable, while the tips of the legs contained traction field generators, which allowed the droid to walk up walls or even along ceilings. 
Like their Spelunker counterparts, chameleon droids were also deployed onto target planets via hyperspace-capable drop pods, allowing them to function completely independently from a larger Separatist force. The original Spelunker's lower main body was dominated by a storage bay for mining charges, and this was retained on the chameleon droid, but the basic blasting charges were replaced with a payload of 24 fragmentation mines, which were much more powerful. The Spelunker's chest-mounted sensor package was removed and replaced with a set of three small but powerful laser cannons, which were capable of a rapid and extremely precise fire. The mines were the chameleon droid's primary weapons, but naturally, it favoured the laser cannons in actual combat. But the biggest change made to the droid was, of course, the addition of its camouflage array. This wasn't a genuine cloaking device. No stygium crystals were involved, and the chameleon droid couldn't actually turn itself fully invisible. Rather, it performed visual scans of its surroundings, determined the likely perspectives of hostiles it wished to avoid, and used a set of ultra-detailed holographic projections to obscure it from view. When the viewer was stationary, this worked perfectly, rendering the chameleon droid effectively invisible from their angle. The chameleon droid's holographic arrays could also automatically adjust to account for the droid's movements. If the viewer moved unexpectedly, however, the illusion would fade, requiring the chameleon droid to maintain stealth, even when camouflaged. Fire from the droid's laser cannons also disrupted the stealth field. Mine laying, however, did not. The chameleon droid's job was to sneak behind enemy lines using its holographic camouflage arrays and plant mines at target sites. The purpose and execution of this strategy tended to vary. When the droids were targeting a structure, such as a Republic Command Center, they would simply plant their mines and blow the target. At other times, however, chameleon droids were assigned to assassinate specific targets or take out a specific group of clone troopers. When this was the case, they would lay mines while camouflaged, then disengage camouflage and open fire on their target with their laser cannons, hoping to lure the enemy into the mined area so it could blow them to hell. Chameleon droids were highly effective at all of these jobs. They were deployed rarely, so Republic forces never got the experience to get used to and readily know how to beat the droids' camouflage systems. Their frag mines were incredibly destructive and very effective against the Republic's walkers, especially the ATTE, which would typically suffer heavy damage to its vulnerable underside when it stepped on a mine due to its short legs. The Chameleon Droid was the Commerce Guild's ace in the hole, and though it was rarely used, it always made an impact. The Chameleon Droid's first appearance was on Ilum four months into the Clone Wars, where at least 50 of them were sent in hyperspace pods to blow up the Jedi Temple there, blocking access to the Crystal Caves. They succeeded in doing severe damage to the temple and nearly killing Luminara on Julian and Barriss Offi, but the droids were destroyed by Yoda and Padme Amidala, who rescued the trapped Jedi from the ruins of the temple. The Jedi were able to repair the damage done to the temple, but the droids still sent a message to the council. There were only two other known appearances of the Chameleon Droid. During the Battle of Ryloth, Chameleon Droids were deployed in a last-ditch defense of the captured city of Resden, which remained in Separatist hands after the capture of the planetary capital. Anakin Skywalker and Ahsoka Tano led the 501st in liberating Resden, destroying these Chameleon Droids as they did so. The droids also appeared on Felucia when it came under attack during the Outer Rim sieges, defending the Commerce Guild's headquarters against advancing Republic forces. The specific role they played is unknown, but it can be assumed that all chameleon droids on the planet were either destroyed or disabled by the time Felucia came under Imperial control. The DSD-1 Dwarf Spider Droid was one of the CIS droid army's most ubiquitous units. It was to the Confederacy as the ATRT was to the Republic, a nimble, versatile light walker that usually acted as Republic Force's primary light vehicle. Often working together with the much larger OG-9 homing spider droid, the dwarf spider droid made appearances on many of the battlefields of the Clone Wars from Geonosis to Kashyyyk, and on each one of them, it proved itself extremely effective for its size. In this video, we'll be taking a closer look at the dwarf spider droid and its history. The DSD-1 dwarf spider droid, along with its larger cousin, the OG-9 homing spider droid, 
was designed by Bactoid Armor Workshop for the Commerce Guild Punitive Security Forces. These two spider droid models were the core of the Commerce Guild's droid army, and they were meant to work in tandem, with four or so dwarf spider droids acting as spotters and armed scouts for a bonded homing spider droid on the battlefield. Their intended purpose was a sinister one. The Commerce Guild wanted to use them to break strikes on its mining worlds and seize mines from rival corporations. The dwarf spider droid was especially useful to the guild in this capacity. While the homing spider droid was generally restricted to surface operations, the dwarf spider droid was small enough to fit in mine shafts, for which it earned the nickname of Burrowing Spider Droid. The Commerce Guild would deploy these droids into its mines to force striking miners back to work, and it would also send them into the mines of rival companies to seize them for its own use. The Commerce Guild considered the dwarf spider droid's performance in such operations satisfactory, and the punitive security forces commissioned untold thousands of them from Bactoid. The dwarf spider droid consisted of a more or less spherical body supported by four thin spider-like legs. This main body contained the droid's onboard reactor, its power cells, its droid brain and its sensors, primarily four forward-mounted photoreceptors, two large and two small. All of this was topped with an extremely tough armored dome, which provided the droid's important components with protection from blaster fire. The dwarf spider droid's dome was topped with an adjustable antenna, which connected it wirelessly to nearby homing spider droids, allowing the droid to directly transmit sensor data to its larger counterpart. The dwarf spider droid's legs were thin and somewhat vulnerable, but they provided the droid with excellent maneuverability and speed. The droid's feet appeared to have been magnetized, allowing it to crawl straight up cliffs or vertical mine shafts, making the dwarf spider droid exceptionally versatile. It could perform well in a variety of environments. Despite its nickname, the dwarf spider droid doesn't appear to have been able to use its legs to burrow, though it was certainly capable of fighting in burrows made by others. The dwarf spider droid was extremely intelligent, capable of communicating in binary, expressing frustration and other such emotions, and infamously even refusing orders that it believed would cause its destruction. Despite this apparent aversion to suicidal orders, dwarf spider droids were equipped with a self-destruct system that they occasionally used to blow up hostiles who happened to get too close. Apparently, suicide on the orders of a commander was a bridge too far, but suicide to own the meat bags was acceptable to a dwarf spider droid. Apart from its self-destruct mechanism, the dwarf spider droid's primary weapon was a single forward-mounted fixed laser cannon. This weapon was quite powerful and had a variety of firing modes. It could fire off less powerful anti-personnel blasts with a fairly high rate of fire, or it could charge up for more powerful blasts. The Battle of Teth indicates that it might have had a flak setting, but this is just speculation on our part. The more powerful fire setting allowed the dwarf spider droid to shoot down LAAT gunships and severely damage heavy ground vehicles, making this droid an accomplished killer. However, this cannon could also be a weakness in certain situations. It was fixed, thus requiring the droid to turn its head to target it, and it was long enough that in suitably narrow places it would prevent the droid from turning around, allowing it to be destroyed from behind. The Commerce Guild also commissioned a variant of the Dwarf Spider Droid, the ADSD Advanced Dwarf Spider Droid. This unit was rarely seen even during the Clone Wars, but it was extraordinarily powerful. This mofo was somewhere between the DSD-1 and OG-9. It was roughly the same shape as the Dwarf Spider Droid, but it was larger and much, much more heavily armoured. The Advanced Dwarf Spider Droid was almost completely covered by heavy armour, and while the standard Dwarf Spider Droid could be taken down with a few well-placed blaster shots, it took vehicle fire or anti-armor rounds to bring down an advanced dwarf spider droid. Its lone weak spot was its optical cluster, but it had countermeasures to prevent enemies from taking advantage of it. Its front legs featured two large blast shields that it could bring in front of its eyes, and if those were destroyed, it also had an adjustable armored flap that covered the optical cluster directly. Other differences between the advanced dwarf spider droid and its smaller cousin were a pair of floodlights built into the legs and its increased firepower. 
The main weapon of the advanced dwarf spider droid was a heavy laser cannon mounted on top of the droid. Unlike the fixed cannon of the droid, this weapon was turret mounted and it was also extraordinarily powerful, able to wipe out whole platoons of infantry. As if that wasn't bad enough, the advanced dwarf spider droid boasted a pair of fire-linked missile launchers with a total capacity of 36 frag missiles for both of them. These allowed it to annihilate armored vehicles and infantry alike. The droid's lone shortcoming was that it was sluggish, enabling skilled commandos to outflank and destroy it. The dwarf spider droid, and to a lesser degree its advanced counterpart, saw action all throughout the Clone Wars. Both were first encountered in the first Battle of Geonosis, in which two advanced dwarf spider droids were encountered and destroyed by Delta Squad and 15,000 standard dwarf spider droids fought in the ground battle. Despite the Confederacy's defeat at Genosis, both versions of the droid proved their worth in this opening battle, killing many clones and destroying many Republic vehicles. For the rest of the war, the advanced dwarf spider droid was a rare sight. Its only other notable appearance was during the Battle of Kashyyyk, where several fought in and around the city of Kachiro. But the standard dwarf spider droid became extremely common. Whenever the Confederacy deployed homing spider droids, dwarf spider droids were almost always sent out alongside them, but in many battles, it was even deployed on its own or to support other armored separatist vehicles. It became the Confederacy's favored light vehicle, seeing more action than the older STAP or newer crab droid. Early in the war, dwarf spider droids appeared in the Battle of Mutilants, the Battle of Brentel IV, the Battle of Atrakin, and the Battle of Jabim. In the Battle of Teth, they were the Confederacy's primary armored vehicles, using precise fire to down LAAT gunships and ATTEs alike. They participated in all of the many battles fought on Felucia, especially the Second Battle of Felucia, and they later fought in the Battle of Malastare, the Battle of Onderon, and the Battle of Ringovinda. Dwarf spider droids also participated extensively in the Outer Rim sieges and the Battle of Coruscant, with a notable appearance on Escart during the Jedi Order's hunt for Darth Sidious. Hundreds of dwarf spider droids marched across the floor of the Wawat Archipelago's lagoons during the Battle of Kashyyyk, leading the charge against Republic and Wookiee defensive positions outside Kachiro. In this battle, they were meant to counter the Republic's ATRT walkers. At the end of the Clone Wars, all dwarf spider droids were shut down, but they didn't stay that way for long. Officers in the Republic turned Imperial military recognized the effectiveness of these units, and vast numbers of them were seized from former separatist warehouses for use in service to the Empire. The Stormtrooper Corps in particular made extensive use of the dwarf spider droid deploying these units as attack dogs against former separatist worlds, turning them against the systems they had been built to defend. The dwarf spider droid continued to see service throughout the Imperial era, after which it was finally retired. The Colocoids were some of the most feared inventors the Star Wars galaxy had to offer. These cannibalistic insectoids were infamous for their droidicas, which were known across the galaxy some of the deadliest battle droids on the market. But the droidicas weren't the only product of the Colocoid creation nest, and many of their other designs were infamous in their own right. Some of the most fearsome were the Tri-Fighter, one of the most effective space superiority fighters ever made, the Buzz Droid, a nuisance for Republic Starfighter pilots, and the Skopinek Annihilator droid, recently seen in the Book of Boba Fett. But the Colocoid's greatest invention was much more obscure. The Protodecker, a monstrously powerful hover tank. In this video, we'll be discussing this rare separatist behemoth in detail. To truly appreciate the Protodecker, we need to do a quick refresher about its designers, the Colocoids. The Colocoids were insectoids, and their bodies somewhat resembled their iconic droidicas, which were built in their image. They were tough and exceptionally brutal, with a propensity for violence despite their relative lack of emotion. Colocoids tended to be ruthless, efficient, cunning, and greedy, and as such, they made excellent business beings. But the Colocoids were perhaps most known for their ravenous hunger, which drove them to devour other sentient beings and even each other. These violent carnivores had no qualms with cannibalism, 
and they had a habit of eating off-worlders foolish enough to land on their homeworld, Collar 4. Their propensity toward cannibalism may have been the cause of their seeming viciousness and lack of empathy. Whether or not this was the case, the Colicoids were certainly dangerous. But Colicoids were also innately curious and intensely creative, with many of them excelling at mechanical work, science, and especially droid design. Their society was extremely advanced, and despite their tendency to eat negotiators sent to their homeworld, the Colicoids had strong trade relationships with many outside organizations, most notably the Trade Federation, to whom they sold droids. The Colicoids weren't a true hive species, but they had queens and their society was governed by nests. One of these was the Colicoid Creation Nest, which designed the planet's famous droidicas. In the years before the Clone Wars, most of the Colicoid Creation Nest's products were manufactured on Collar 4, but after the Colicoids joined the Confederacy of Independent Systems, the Colicoid Creation Nest began providing droid designs to its separatist allies to be produced on mech worlds like Geonosis and Hypori. Such was the case with the Colicoid Creation we'll be discussing today, the Protodecker, which was designed by the Colicoid Creation Nest, but produced by the Geonosian Industries shortly before the Clone Wars. The designer of the Protodecker was one of the Colicoid's most gifted engineers, but he apparently had a reputation as a bit of a mad scientist. That checks out. It would take a madman to design this thing, even by Colicoid standards. The other Colicoids believed this engineer was dangerous, and a few months into the Clone Wars, they actually exiled him from Collar 4, despite the success of his protodeckers imprisoning him in the Fortress of Axion, a corporate fortress in the Colicoid's recently purchased colony of Axion. The protodecker was technically a repulse lift tank, an absolutely gargantuan one. We don't have exact numbers for its size, but it made ATTEs look small, and it was closer to the size of a stock freighter or transport ship than a tank. Despite its vast size, it was mobile, and while it wasn't very fast, it was more maneuverable than an ATT and able to turn pretty rapidly and fly forwards at an appreciable speed. Its design is hard to describe. The protodecker's core section was blocky and built atop a flat, vaguely octagonal platform, while two wings jutted out from the top of the main body at an angle. The protodecker's core contained its onboard reactor and built-in droid brain. Did we mention that this whole thing was one enormous droid? And its lower platform was packed full of repulsor lift and propulsion systems, keeping the protodecker stable and mobile. The protodecker was extremely heavily armored, able to stand up to fire from an ATTE's mass driver cannon. It took a barrage of dedicated artillery to bring one of these behemoths down, and this was still easier said than done, as the protodecker had enough firepower to lay waste to an entire column of ATTEs in a matter of seconds. In practice, only Jedi flying Agile Republic fighter tanks stood a chance against the protodecker as they could outmaneuver it while peppering it with fire. However, this took a long time and it often required more ammunition than was available. Its thick layers of armor allowed the protodecker to just smash clean through enemy fortifications. Indeed, this was an intended part of its design as the protodecker was intended to be a siege weapon. More specifically, the protodecker was meant to end sieges as it was capable of plowing through durasteel walls. On top of that, this monster was armed to the teeth. Its primary weapons were a pair of forward-mounted, rapid-firing turbo laser cannons that could spray pure explosive death all over a battlefield. These guns melted ATTEs in just a few shots, and they could probably rip through the shields of grounded capital ships. They weren't the protodecker's only weapons either. The protodecker's wings were actually missile launchers stocked with dozens of aspect-seeking concussion missiles, which the protodecker could spray off in volleys to erase entire armored divisions. The protodecker's final weapon was its most exotic, a seismic wave emitter. This was mounted on the bow of the protodecker and its function was quite simple. Whenever enemy vehicles or infantry got too close to a protodecker, it could fire this thing and send them all flying back. This probably pulverized enemy infantry immediately, turning clone troopers into crushed plastoid and reddish goop, and it disabled the shields of armored vehicles, rendering them vulnerable to the protodecker's other weapons. 
This seismic wave emitter probably played a role in the protodecker's ability to plow through everything in its path. It would be easier to punch through a wall when you've got an earthquake gun, after all. In case you couldn't tell by now, the protodecker was an absolute juggernaut, and when it made appearances on the battlefields of the Clone Wars, it posed a massive threat to Republic forces. Not even the most entrenched Republic positions could withstand an assault from a protodecker, and the Republic was lucky that it was the one besieging Separatist positions for most of the war, and not the other way around. Fortunately for the Republic, protodeckers were enormously expensive and were overkill for most battlefield scenarios, and as a result, they were pretty rare, only making a scattering of confirmed appearances in the early months of the war. The most important of these came during the Dark Reaper Crisis, Count Dooku's campaign to rebuild an ancient Sith super weapon. When Dooku's forces descended on Raxus Prime to search for the Force Harvester, the core of the Dark Reaper, the Count brought a protodecker with him which he unleashed on Republic forces as a parting gift while he fled the planet with the Harvester. The protodecker obliterated the invasion force the Republic had deployed on Raxus Prime, taking out two ATTEs, an ATXT, and two Republic fighter tanks within roughly 20 seconds of its deployment. The behemoth was ultimately brought down by Obi-Wan Kenobi, however, who used the junk of Raxus Prime's scrapyards as cover while he fired on the protodecker with his fighter tank. At the end of the Dark Reaper Crisis, more protodeckers were deployed in the Battle of Thul. As Republic and Separatist forces clashed over the ancient city of Kesiak, where Dooku had reassembled the Dark Reaper, two protodeckers were deployed at the gates of the city, where they bombarded any Republic units that got too close. However, these protodeckers were also destroyed thanks to the combined efforts of Mace Windu and Luminara Unjuli, who led squadrons of fighter tanks in engaging these monsters. With the protodeckers destroyed, Republic forces were ultimately able to take Kesiak, destroy the Dark Reaper, and win the Battle of Thul. It was after, and perhaps because of, this defeat that the protodecker's designer was imprisoned on the fortress of Axion. His creations continued to see use, however, and as a result, the Republic tried to take Axion three months into the Clone Wars, hoping to capture the Colloquoid Engineer and learn of any weaknesses the protodecker might have had. The Republic force sent to Axion was massacred, however, leaving only a single clone trooper, Commander Brolis, alive. Brolis was rescued from Axion by Master Yoda, but the mission ended in failure, and the protodecker continued to be a thorn in the Republic's sight. 